My message title today is Seeing Jesus, Seeing Jesus. You know, one of the organs that we most often take for granted is our eyes. We only seem to notice them when we start losing our eyesight. Then we go to run to the doctor. But other than that, we really don't give the time of day to our eyes. And you know what? When you start to study the eyes and learn about it, you'll find out it's one of the most incredible organs that we have in our body. Do you know that your eyeball stays the same size from birth till death? Did you know that? It doesn't grow. Our ears grow, our noses grow, and you can see mine done over job there, or overcharge, but our eyeballs don't grow from birth until death. And you know what? Out of all the colors we see, if you look around the church, and you, you can just like imagine there's probably a hundred, maybe even a thousand different colors here. It all comes from three primary colors, the red, blue, and the green. And from those three colors, we see a myriad of different colors. For the woman itself, they can see up to a million colors. Isn't that amazing? Well done to your woman who can do that. Men, we see red, green, blue. That's, that's all we see. We don't see anything in between, all right? If you look at the chair, it's pink, all right? There's nothing else to it. And you know what? At the back of your retina, in the back of your eyeball, there's a blind spot. Do you know there's a blind spot? So there's a part of your vision right now that you are not seeing. And your brain is making up the difference. I'll prove it to you. Let's do an exercise together. Hold out your two fingers like this. Put them together. All right, like this. Are you watching me? Up to your eye level, and then about 15 centimeters apart from your eyes. Are you with me? Okay, keep them like that. Slowly separate the two fingers, just a little bit. And then what I want you to do is to lift your eyes above your fingers, look into the distance, and see what you see. You should see a middle finger appearing. Anybody see that? Yeah, you see that little, it looks like a little sausage. Do you see it? Do you see it, McKenz? Oh. Now, that little sausage finger that some of you saw is not physically there. We can all agree to that. But your brain made up the difference. You know, your brain is such an, uh, uh, an awkward and incredible organ in our bodies. Do you know that your eyes always see your nose? Close your one eye, and you'll notice that you see the bridge and tip of your nose. Do you see that? And the other eye, the same thing. But your brain chooses not to see it. When you open both eyes up, your brain says, don't look at your nose, and you don't see it. Isn't that amazing? You, know, you laugh. It's all true, man. And this is the same thing. Our eyes are only part of the equation. When you're looking at me and the church, it's only part of the job. Your eyes is just the camera flash. That's all it is, the camera going up and down. Your brain is doing most of the job. So when you're looking at pictures, your brain is actually computing what you see. And sometimes your brain gets it confused. And that's what we call optical illusions. When you see pictures that your brain struggles to comprehend. So let me show you a couple of these pictures and let me see if how good your brains are working. Like this old lady. Who sees the old lady? Put up your hand. Yes, yeah, some of you see the old lady. Do you see the old lady? And, and if you're very, very clever, you also see there's a young woman. Do you see? There's her chin, there's her eyes, there's her hair. Do you see the young woman? So when you first saw that, you immediately saw an old lady. What if I told you that the actual picture was of the young woman? So those who saw the old lady were incorrect. You were seeing the wrong picture. This one isn't, what, what is this, Mackenzie? An elephant. How many legs does that elephant have? Look at Mackenzie's face. She doesn't know what's going on with that picture. You see, our brain knows that there's four legs on the elephant. But when you look at that picture, your brain is thinking, oh, man, I don't know what to do. I don't know what, what this is going. Eight, four, three, two. That's how your brain works. Look at this picture. If you're looking at it, you might see again up and down. It looks like it's contracting and expanding. All right, you see it goes up and down, but it's not. It's a static picture. It's your brain filling in the gaps. Are you seeing the black dots or are you seeing the white dots? Who sees white ones? Who sees black ones? Yeah, exactly, we don't know. Your brain doesn't know what to do. It's just seeing dots. And as you, blink your eye, as you blink your eyes up and down, you see different colors all the time. And this one, for those of you back in Woodstock in the 1960s, with Janis Joplin, you might be familiar. I oh, know, Robert saying, yeah, I was there, man. <laughs> and Nico, yeah, I was there, man. Uh, a little bit of Janis Joplin and 
LSD and this is what you got. And this picture, if you are looking at it, should be like pulsating. It'll go in and out. Same as this one. If you're looking at it, for some of you whose brains are actually working tonight, they might actually see like it's moving around. It looks like it's going like this and it's like drawing you into a tunnel. It's weird. Eh? But it's not, this is not peak photography. This is actually just a picture. Your brain is looking at this and because of the colors and lines, your brain is filling in the gaps and making you see something that's not actually there. Here's another one. So you might be looking at this and if, if you just see it for a bit or move your eyes, you'll see it looks like the paper's folding. It looks like this picture's folding up and down again. Is it doing that? Do you see that? It's weird. And that, but it's not. It's just colors. Oh, does it look like the elephant picture? Whoa, 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 whoa. There's like far too many pictures there. Let's go back to, nope, let's try that again. And, and in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> this one. Uh, the Rubik's Cube. You'll see the colors. Uh, what color is that? And that color? Yellow. Brown and yellow. Would you be surprised to find out that they're both brown? If you take away all the colors around it and the contrast and shades, both those tiles are dark brown. But your brain, because of the other colors here and the shadows, chooses to see yellow. It makes you wonder, what are the colors are you seeing out there that your brain is manipulating? Here's another one. What are those colors? Are the spheres? Can you believe it? They're actually all pink. The actual color of those circles is dark pink. But because of those lines in between, your brain has seen it. And I'm not going to lie to you, your brain is just making up its own story. That's what's happening. Your brain is saying, well, those are not dark pink circles. They are actually the yellow and the purples. Here's an exercise for you to do. Here's a, a negative lady. For those wanting to get married, don't pick negative ladies. Pick positive ladies. So what I want you to do to this negative image of the ladies, look at her nose. There's a dot on her nose, a little a spot. I want you to look at that spot for 15 to 20 seconds. Just try to not blink. Just stare at it. And then what I want you, after the 15 seconds, just quickly look at the white space on the right-hand side. Does anybody see anything? Ah, Lionel saw it, yeah. Do you see it, Lynn? You saw it. You can do it again if you want. This is not, no, this is not again trick photography. This is just that picture and it's a white space. It's, it's amazing, eh? So, so we see that picture and let's be honest, it doesn't look that good. But once you look on this side, you see a beautiful woman appear, right? It's amazing. That's how your brain works. I thought about it. What if I could manipulate this? What if I could harness the power of visual manipulation? That would be awesome. I'll be a millionaire, probably a billionaire. What if I could sell you something that you can look at your partner and they will physically change? Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, it would, wouldn't it? Yeah. So, so let's start with the, the men. Uh, you, you love your wife, all right? But she's not the prettiest rose in the garden, right? And I sell you a red dot to put on her nose. And all you got to do, guys, is stare at that dot for 15 seconds. And voila, <laughs> Marilyn Monroe. I would buy that. <laughs> it's not only for the, the guys, it's also for the girls. So you girls, you, you, you married to a, your husband and you love him. But let's be honest, you married him for the money. All right. That's all you married him for. And I, I sell you this dot. You put it on his nose. And for 15 seconds, you look at it and you're looking at it. And I know Ingrid's thinking, I've got to get this. And all of a sudden, yay, Tom Cruise. Yeah. And now just for the ladies in the church, you can upgrade this. You can get an upgrade on Tom Cruise. If you look at his nose for a very good price, I'm talking a, a, a astronomical amount of money, which you probably can't afford anyway. If you look at Tom Cruise's nose for 15 seconds, just for the ladies, you will get an upgrade on him, and this is what you'll see. <laughs> a younger version of, wow, when I was young and beautiful. Now I'm old and beautiful. I'm only kidding. As I said, you won't be able to afford it, don't worry. My wife can't even afford me, so don't worry. But your eyes are incredible, aren't they? Just from this like, little presentation, you can see how amazing your vision is, how amazing your brains work in tandem with that. And as I said before, the only time we really come to grasp with our eyesight is when it goes bad, when it deteriorates. And then we get to run to the doctor, then we get eyeglasses, or if you're lucky, you get eye surgery, or something gets done. But if your eyes deteriorate to the point of blindness, it's over. It's for the bay. You, 
you, you, you, no, you're not going to die yet. But <laughs> you, maybe you will. I don't know. No, but when you go permanently blind, you, you cannot restore your sight. Even with today's modern technology and science, doctors cannot make a blind person see. Do you know that there's two million parts to our eye? Can I say that again? Two million individual parts in our eye. When the doctors look at that, they think, I'm not going to touch this because I'm going to botch it up. So they just leave it. So as to date, in history, no doctors have ever made a blind person see. But there is one person in history that has made blind people see. And I guess you know what his name is. His name is Jesus Christ. Yeah. Do you know what? Even in the biblical records, no one else has done that. The apostles and prophets. They have done amazing things, great miracles. They've raised the dead and healed people. But none of them have made a blind person see. As what we know, there's only one person in history that has ever done that, and that is Jesus Christ. So today what I want to do is look at a story of Jesus Christ and a man called Bartimaeus. So we're going to do and we're going to read from the Gospel of Luke. If you have your Bibles, if not, you can just read on the screen. This is from the NIV version. It says, it says Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting at, by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked, what is happening? They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more. Are we still on the same page? Yes. He shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And then the next couple of verses, Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has yielded you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the other people saw it, they also praised God. Let me give you a bit of context around this man. His name was Bartimaeus. In Luke, it doesn't say that, but in the Gospel of Mark, it does complement that and actually give him a name, Bartimaeus. When you see Bar in front of a name, it means son of. All right, say so Bartholomew, Bartimaeus, it means son of Timaeus. So this guy was Bartimaeus. He was also blind, the Bible tells us. And today's society, blind people can still get around. They can be productive in our society because we've got the tools and aids and support to help them. But back in Jesus' day, if you were blind, there was no help for you. You couldn't get a job. You had to immediately go, re be rejected and go into the poverty line. And this is where he was. Bartimaeus ended up begging on this roadside into Jericho. And we all know what beggars are. We see them in the corner streets over here. We see them all around towns in the intersections. They normally hold up signs that says, we'll work for money or please help. And I looked on the internet and found some other really, really interesting signs that beggars were holding up. These are legitimate signs that beggars are holding up. Look at this one. Plan A, need beer money. Plan B, then I will work for food. <laughs> Here's another one. This guy says, my family was kidnapped by ninjas, need a couple of dollars for karate lessons. So this is very, very creative and innovative. I love this one. This guy says, my family was abducted by aliens. I need money to build a spacecraft. <laughs> That's my favorite one of all the, and this poor guy is just honest. He says he needs cash for alcohol research. <laughs> so we don't know if Bartimaeus had a sign or not. Probably not, but he was a beggar nonetheless. So what I want to do today is look at just four areas where we can relate to God and how we can follow God and obey Him. The first one is called Hear Him. Hear Him, and we're going to read a textual sermon. We're going to read from the same verses. The first couple, it says, As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging when he what? Heard, when he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening, Jesus. Uh, they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. So this guy, Bartimaeus, was by the, the side, going, by the gate going into Jericho. The, and all of a sudden, he couldn't see anything, but he heard a commotion. number of feet, people were shouting, coming past him, and, and he grabbed the guys around him and said, what's happening, what's happening? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And everybody's heard of Jesus of Nazareth by this time. His fame had been widespread. And Bartimaeus, blind as he was, knew about the miracles that Jesus had done. He knew that he was the son of God. He knew he was the Messiah. He knew that he raised dead people. He knew that he healed people. For Bartimaeus, it was even more important and personal because he knew that Jesus made blind men see. Ah, then all of a sudden, something rose up on the inside of Bartimaeus and he said, man, I've got to get to this guy. I've got to get to Jesus. And he shouted out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Notice, he believed in Jesus because he what? Heard about Jesus. Just like Bartimaeus, me and you haven't seen Jesus physically, but we heard about him. 
We heard about him through the word of God. We heard about him through ministers, people, our teachers, um, our ministers, our parents. We heard about Jesus, and that's what our faith is based on. Not only the facts, sir. I don't only believe that Jesus was born in Bethlehem and died in Jerusalem. I believe in Jesus Christ because he changed my life. It's transformational. He changes lives. There's another story in the Bible about Jesus healing the blind man. And after that, he didn't see Jesus. He goes away, washes his eyes. He comes back and he's interrogated by the religious leaders. They want to know who made you see. Who is this guy, Jesus? How is it that you were born blind? And, I can, and they were interrogating him. And this guy says, man, I don't know all the answers. But this I do know. I was blind, but now I see. That's all that mattered to this man. He said, look at me. I am the evidence that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. It's the same for you and I. I don't just believe in the facts about the resurrection. I believe that Jesus Christ is alive and living in me. That's what makes me a Christian. And it's all because I heard about Jesus. Romans chapter 10 says, They that call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How shall they believe if they have not heard? Then it says, Hearing comes by the word of God. You and I may not have seen Jesus like Bartimaeus, but we have heard about Jesus, and that is where our faith lies. We heard about him, and we believe. Let's look at our next point. The next point is shout for him. It says this in the next couple of verses. He, he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him, be quiet. But he shouted out all the more. I love that phrase, what he says there, son of David. Son of David, because what Bartimaeus was doing was acknowledging that this Jesus of, of Nazareth was a king. He was from the line of David, from the line of King David, the royal line. He was not only saying, this guy is a guy from Nazareth. He was saying, son of David, I believe that you are the king of kings. And he shouts out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You would think that his friends were encouraging. You would think that his friends come to him and say, oh, I bought him a shout out louder. Come on, says Jesus, you can hear this is your time. But they don't do that. They rebuke him. They scold him, humiliate him. Shut up. Stop making an embarrassment of yourselves. What are you doing trying to humiliate us? Stop shouting out for Jesus. They're trying to intimidate him into silence. And did he remain silent? No. It says he shouted out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. He wanted to get Jesus' attention and he wasn't going to be quiet. He wasn't going to be silenced by the people around him. Let me tell you, when you're bold enough to shout out for Jesus, not everyone's going to be on your side. Not everybody's going to be as excited as you are. When you become a Christian, maybe you were criticized by your own family and friends. Maybe you were called weird and a freak. You know what I was called? A Jesus freak. Do you know that? Because I was so weird and freaked out. You know what? I'd rather be a Jesus freak on my way to heaven than a non-believer on my way to hell. Amen. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you. <laughs> because this guy shouted out for Jesus. He wasn't going to be intimidated. He wasn't going to be silenced. You know, there's two Greek words used in this, in this passage. The first one, where he calls out to Jesus, is bio. It's a Greek word. It means to shout out loud. In the next verse, when he shouts out all the more, it's another Greek word called krazo. Can you say that with me? Krazo. Sounds like crazy, doesn't it? But it's not. It's completely unrelated. It means to shout and scream out from the bottom of your lungs. And you know what? These sound foreign concepts to us, but the men are familiar with these terms all the time. And I'll say the men, and I, some of the ladies are even going to smile because you know where this is going. You see, because if you're married and you have a fight with your wife, what does she start with? Bio. She shouts out loud, hey, Johnny, you know. I know. <laughs> and then what happens? Just like that, she goes from bio to krazo, and she starts screaming out. <laughs> yeah, all the men are nodding. So, uh, Nick is not. He's just looking straight ahead thinking, I'm not going to look. I'm not going to make eye contact. Because some of you are going to get beaten on the way home with this, all right? You're going to say, Raymond said, you krazo. <laughs> but that's what it means. It means to scream out. It means to shout out. This guy wasn't going to be intimidated by the people around him. This is my moment. This is my time. Nobody's going to hold me back. Jesus, have mercy on me. You know what I think the church needs? I think we need a couple more Christians who are krazo. I think we need a couple more Christians who will shout out for Jesus. And not be intimidated by this world. Not be kicked down in the dust. 
There's too many Christians begging blind on the wayside instead of standing up and defending and fighting for what we have. As Christians, we should be defending and fighting for this book. We should be fighting for our families, fighting for our marriages, fighting for our children, but we're not. We're acting as blind beggars and we're letting people walk past us, kick dust in our face. The church has been too quiet for too long and we need to rise up. What we need is not a revival in the church. We need a revolution. A spiritual revolution where we change the way we think and act and do things. Nothing in this world will change until you change. I know that the Christians and everybody looks out there and we, we kind of, we look outside and we blame other people. Look how bad the world is. You know what I blame for the state of affairs out there? You, the Christian. Because we're doing nothing about it. We're quick to complain and criticize about how bad it is out there, but you are the people that are the light and the love of the world. Why aren't you doing anything about it? You know why? Because we're blind and begging. And we're letting the world walk over us. We're letting minority groups rule us. We're so worried about being politically correct. We're forgetting about being publicly correct. We need to defend this and we need to speak it out. And I know some people call me controversial. My wife shouts at me all the time. So I'm not going to use certain people and groups because I'm going to stop there because in case I get a legal action against me. Uh, but there's things that are right and things that are wrong. And Christians are compromising too much. And, we, and we're letting people just go past. No, I don't want, to, don't, don't want to rock the boat. Don't want to get involved. We have to get involved. You know, some Christians aren't even on the boat to rock it. It's but time that we stand up and we shout out for Jesus. This is the time. There's never been a time more needed than right now today, even in Utene, for us to stand up and do something. Let's stop complaining about how the world is and let us be the ones who change the world. Amen. Thank you to those three people who said amen. The rest of you, you know what you got to do. All right. Let's look at the third one. It's, I don't know. It's either I'm possessed or this thing's possessed. Uh, ask him. Ask him. Let's read that couple of verses. It says this. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see you, he replied. And I love this part because... First of all, Jesus instructs someone to go and get Bartimaeus and bring him to him. Did you notice that part? Jesus says, go and fetch him and bring him to me. Things haven't changed in 2,000 years. Jesus is still telling us, the church, to bring people to him. And so often we close the doors on the people outside this church. So often we're so quick to condemn, we forget that those are sinners that need Jesus. Our job is not to condemn. Our job is to bring that sinner with love to Jesus so he can save them and he can clean them. The days of churches shutting the doors to sinners is over. We need to understand that there's people out there that are lost, hurting, brokenhearted, and they need Jesus. They need his love. They need his forgiveness. And we the ones that should be bringing those broken people to Jesus. When Bartimaeus comes before Jesus, it's just an amazing scene. You know, I love movies, and I just see when Bartimaeus comes and stands before Jesus, Jesus probably just holds him on his shoulders or his hands because he can't see, so he's just holding him. And in that moment, I think everyone else disappears, in my mind. There's hundreds of people that were around Jesus and Bartimaeus that day. In my mind, they all disappeared. It's only Jesus and Bartimaeus. There's hundreds of people calling out to Jesus that day, but Jesus only heard one man. One man in desperate agony and anguish, and he cried out to Jesus. And in that moment, Jesus gave this one dirty, blind beggar his undivided attention. Jesus didn't have to do that. Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, and he knew that in a few days he would die on a cross. And with all of that on his mind, he was a man on a mission. You know, I wouldn't have judged Jesus if he just said, I haven't got time for this right now. You know, I've got other stuff on my plate. I've just got to go and do this. I wouldn't have judged Jesus because he's, he had a lot on his plate, a lot on his shoulders to deal with. But Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped and he said, bring me this man. And as if Jesus had nothing else to do, he gave his undivided attention to this one blind beggar. God is the same. When you cry out to him, he will stop everything. And he will come to you as if you're the only person on earth. And he will give you his undivided attention. Jesus asked this man, 
What do you want me to do for you? I think it was obvious. He was blind. Jesus could see that. But Jesus didn't ask to get information. He asked to get confirmation. He wanted blind Bartimaeus to say, I'm blind and I need you to help me. And he did just that. In the most beautiful, shortest prayer in the Bible, Lord, I want to see. Isn't that a beautiful, simple prayer? I think some of our prayers are too long. Too long-winded. We like to hear our own voice. Oh, I want to pray for three hours. Everyone can hear how special and religious and spiritual I am. God just wants the specifics. So when you pray, can I give you this advice? Pray specifically for a person by name and what the condition is. That's how God wants you to pray. I want to pray for this family in America. There's something wrong with them. No, that's not a prayer. Pray specific prayers. This guy said, Lord, God, King of Kings, I'm blind and I want to see. And God said, your faith has yielded you. He didn't even touch him. He didn't touch him. He didn't blow on him. He didn't spit on him. Nothing. He just said, your faith has yielded you. And this man opened his eyes. And what is the first thing he saw? Jesus. Blind Bartimaeus opened his eyes. And for the first time in his life, he could see. And what a beautiful sight that was. Seeing the face of his Savior. You know, I, I love heaven and I can't wait to see the mansions and the, the golden streets and the crystal rivers. But there's something I want far above all the mansions. I want Jesus. And I cannot wait to fall at the feet of the one who died for me. This man, blind Bartimaeus, had that privilege way before we could. And he was healed. This is our last point, our fourth point, And that is simply follow him. Okay, wrong way. Follow him. It says this in the last couple of verses, Jesus said to him, receive your sight, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the other people, they also praise God. I love this part because he has brought to me, he sees for the first time and you could have, he sees for the first time in his life, he could have said, well, thank you, Jesus. I want to go and beg some more. He could have done that. He could have said, thank you, Jesus, for letting me see. I'm going to go start my business. But he didn't do that. What did he do? He followed Jesus. He got his eyes out. He was so thankful that Jesus had done this amazing thing in his life. He just forgot everything. And he said, forget about everything. I'm following this man. And I wouldn't be surprised if Bartimaeus followed Jesus right up to the cross, right up to the upper room on the day of Pentecost. I believe Bartimaeus was probably one of the 120 disciples. He followed Jesus. What a lesson for you and I. I think there's so many Christians living this mediocre, uh, trying to obey the bare minimum requirements of being a Christian. We, we pray now and again if we need to. We read our Bible if we can. Uh, we come to church on Easter and Christmas. Uh, we, we definitely don't share our faith because that's like a no-no for Christians. We, we're kind of doing the bare minimum requirements and that's not what God has called us for. He's called us to follow him. As disciples, we'll pick up our cross. There's too many Christians not following him. We like the name Christian. We like going to heaven. But when it comes to actually following Jesus and doing those, the, and I said like the bare minimum requirements, which is regularly reading the Bible, praying, gathering together in church, and then sharing your faith. That's the one that nobody likes. Sharing your faith. You look at me and say, well, that's my job. Raymond, you the pastor, you must go and get people to Jesus. No, it's your job. There's people in your life, in your family lives, your family, your friends, where you work, in your social people. Those are people that don't know Jesus, and I will never, ever see them. So who is God called to reach out to those people? You. It's about time we start doing that. Become fishers of men. We must do that. It's not, it's not even a, a requirement. If you are a Christian and you love God and you thank Him for what He has given you, we should be obligated to go out to other people and share our faith with Him. Because every time we see a non-believer, what you should see is a person ending up in hell. That's what you should see. And it's not a joke. There's people out there that you see that look sincere, that look good, they got it all together, but because they don't believe in Jesus, they are going to hell. And we... Are doing nothing. We'd rather stay begging and blind. Let them go. It's time for us to, as I said, have a radical change in the way we think and do things as Christians. Because if we don't, this world is doomed. The lost people out there, what hope do they have if it's not for you, the Christian? 
They look into us. You know that. People out there right now crossing the street, they're looking at this church, at the people here and saying, wow, what did they have that I don't have? Man, I'm so hurting and heartbroken. Uh, I wonder if those people in St. Mark's can come and share with me their faith, to share with me what they have. But we don't. We come here religiously every Sunday, we gather together, we shut the doors, and that's the last we ever see of it. This is my prayer for you today, and it's going to scare the hell out of you. I want to pray for each one in this church that God will send one person across your path this week. That one person's going to come across, and when, when you pray, God answers prayer. So that one person's going to come across your path, whether it's at work, at home, and someone's going to come to you this week, and they're going to start asking about spiritual things, about Jesus, God, the Bible, church, and that's going to be your moment. Now notice in that moment, the Holy Spirit's going to be talking to you, saying, remember what Raymond said on Sunday? This is it. <laughs> this is what he prayed about. I want to leave that with you, because you must make the decision. At that point, when that person comes asking things about the Bible or Jesus, what are you going to do? Are you going to say, I'm too scared? Are you going to turn your back and say, no, I don't want to get involved? Or are you going to see this person as a potential person to go to heaven? That's how you should be seen. You know, we haven't seen Jesus, but there's a lot of blind people out there that are Christians that see spiritual truth in deeper ways that we will never, ever see. There's a woman I read about, her name is Fanny Crosby. Anybody heard of Fanny Crosby? So one or two of you. So let me share the story. She was born in 1820. Shortly after birth, she, she got a cold and a fever and her eyes started to swell. The doctors got involved and botched up the whole thing. From birth, she was permanently blind. She lived in darkness her whole life. She was very spirited, creative. She loved music, loved writing poems. In her later years, she started to write praise poems. Those praise poems became hymns. Hymns that we still sing in the church today. One of my favorite hymns that she wrote is Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Do you know that hymn? I love the chorus. I won't sing it for you because you've heard my voice. I'll just say it. Don't laugh. <laughs> this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. I want to leave this with you. What is your story? What is your song? As Christians, what will be your legacy? When you write a poem one day, will you be able to write that? That your love was, that your poem, your story, your song was one of abundance, it was one of love. You can look back on the people that you've led to Jesus. You can look on the great things that Jesus has done in your life. Or will it be like a blind beggar, silenced, int intimidated, not rocking the boat, not, not, not talking up against uh, the, the wrong things? Or will you stand up and shout for Jesus? Will your legacy be, be one of, this is my story, this is my song, and I will never stop praising my Savior all the day long. That should be our story, that should be our song. There's four things that you should do today as a Christian. For us to draw closer to God, for us to follow God, for us to know Him better. The first one is to hear Him, and you've done that, well done. The next one is to shout for him. Whew, that's where we slip in, people. we got to start standing up and fighting and shouting out for Jesus. Ask him. Whatever the burden is, I know Christians got so discouraged over time, they don't ask for the miracle and definitely don't anticipate it no more. I want you to ask for the miracle and anticipate that God's going to deliver that miracle. Why else do we believe in a God that can do all things if we're not going to pray that he does those things? So I want you to rise up in your faith and ask God. Anticipate those miracles. God can do all things. And last of all, most importantly, I need the Christians to start following Him. Pick up your cross daily and follow Him. In Jesus' name. Amen.